Good morning. It's good to be with you again. I'm Pastor Jackson from Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church. Good morning to all of uh, the members of Mount Sinai and anybody else that has joined us or will join us throughout uh, this uh, week viewing this uh, sermon. This morning I want to talk uh, about uh, before and after resurrection since this is Resurrection Sunday morning. Uh, our text for this morning will be Matthew's chapter 28 verse 5 and 6 that reads, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen as he said. Come see the place where he lay. That's our text for today. Father, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday morning, that you would visit us in your word and remind us that uh, there have been other darknesses before and you delivered your people from them all. Let us uh, view your light shining through this COVID-19 darkness and remind us that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, I want to talk to you for a little while, a few minutes about uh, before and after the resurrection. Since we don't know what happened in the tomb as Jesus rose from the dead, to view this would have been more of a strain on the naked eye than looking directly into the S-U-N, as Paul compared at noontime in Acts chapter 9, verse 3 through 5. He says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now God must have known that the blinding light in that tomb was more than the naked eye of mankind could handle and comprehend. So he kept silent as to what took place in the tomb during the actual resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he did give us a good picture of the before and after that will help us to believe the resurrection truth. Let's just walk through it uh, quickly, if you will. Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. in the morning, and from 9 a.m. until noon, he hung in the light on the cross. But at noon, a miraculous darkness covered the land. It was a heaven-sent darkness that lasted for three hours. There were three days back in Egypt of darkness uh, before the Passover, and there was three hours of darkness before the Lamb of God died for the sins of the world on the cross. Jesus had spoken at least three times before this darkness fell. While they were crucifying him, he repeatedly prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He had spoken to the repentant thief and assured him a place in paradise. He had also given his mother into the care of his beloved disciple, John. But when the darkness came, Jesus was silent for three hours. There was 400 years of silence from God between the Old and the New Testament. After the three hours of darkness left, then Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This was in a direct quotation from Psalm 22 verse 1. It was during the time of darkness that Jesus had been made sin for us, as in 
Uh, it's recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He had become, he had be, been forsaken by the Father, that the darkness was a symbol of the judgment that he endured when he was made a curse for us. Psalms 22 and 2 suggest a period of light and a period of darkness. And then Psalms 22 and 3 emphasizes the holiness of God. And how could a holy God look with favor on his son who had become sin in our place? In rapid succession, the Lord spoke three more times. He said, I thirst. And then he said, this to fulfill Psalm 69 and 21. Someone took pity on him and moistened his lips with some sour wine. And then Jesus shouted, it's finished. Father, into thy hand I commit my spirit. The fact that Jesus shouted with a loud voice indicated that he was in complete control of his faculties. Then he voluntarily yielded up his spirit and he died. Though he was crucified through weakness, he exercised wonderful power when he died. Three miracles took place simultaneously. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. An earthquake opened many graves and some saints arose from the dead. The rending of the veil symbolized the wonderful truth that the way was now open to God. There was no more need for temple priest and altars and sacrifices, Jesus became the sacrifice. Jesus had finished the work of salvation on the cross. The earthquake reminds us of what happened at Mount Sinai when God gave the law to Moses in Exodus 19 and 16. The earthquake at Calvary signified that the demands of the law had been met and the curse of the law forever abolished. You can find that in scripture also in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. Now the torn veil indicated that he conquered sin and the earthquake suggests that he conquered the law and fulfilled it and the resurrection proves that he defeated death. We cannot examine this evidence in the same way that the believers did on that first Resurrection Sunday morning. We don't know what took place inside of the tomb as Jesus actually rose from the dead. But we do have the evidence that's found in the Word of God that of what happened after he rose. Jesus was not held by the bonds of death. He had promised to arise from the dead and his word was never broken. The remarkable change in the early believers is another proof of his re resurrection. One day they were discouraged and hiding in defeat, but the next day, they were declaring his resurrection and walking in joyful victory. In fact, they were now willing to die for the truth of the resurrection. If all of this was a manufactured tale, it would never have changed their lives or enabled them to lay down their lives as martyrs. There was over 500 witnesses who saw Jesus alive at one time in 1 Corinthians 15 chapter 15 chapter verses 3 through 8 you'll find that these appearances of the risen Christ was of such a nature that they could not be explained as hallucinations or self-deceptions and the people who saw him were surprised 
it would have been impossible for over 500 people to suffer the same hallucination at the same time. Even the Apostle Paul, who was an enemy of the church, saw the risen Christ that, that experienced the transforming of his life. And whenever you show enough see Jesus through the word of God, you will experience the transforming power of God working through his word. His word will come alive in you. In you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to the, all of the apostles. And last of all, as to one born at, out of due season, an untimely birth, he appeared also to me, Paul says, the existence of the church and the New Testament and the Lord's Day adds even more proof that Jesus is alive. For centuries, the Jews had been God's people, and they had honored the seventh day, the Sabbath. But then a change took place. The Jews and Gentiles united in the church and became God's people. They met on the first day of the week, the Lord's day. The New Testament is a lie if Jesus is dead. For every part of it points to a risen Christ. It is when we are obeying God's word that he comes to us. Jesus had already appeared to Mary Magdalene in the garden. And notice that our Lord's first two resurrection appearances were to believing women. Say hallelujah, glory women. These faithful women were not only the last to leave Calvary, but they were also the first to come to the tomb. Their devotion to Jesus was rewarded. All hell is what Jesus said to them which can be translated grace. What a marvelous greeting for the resurrection day, grace. The women fell at his feet and took hold of him and worshiped him. Not only did the angels commission them, but the Lord also commissioned them. The phrase that Jesus used, my brethren, go and tell my brethren, reveals the intimate relationship between Christ and his followers. And it's still that way today. Jesus had spoken similar words to Mary Magdalene earlier that morning. But now Jesus reinforced the instructions of the angel that the disciples were to meet him in Galilee. In the garden, Jesus had told his disciples that he would rise from the dead and meet them in Galilee, but probably they had forgotten about it. In Matthew's 26 chapter, verse 31 and 32, we read, Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd." and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. While the believers were worshiping the living Christ, the unbelievers were plotting to destroy the witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by now, some of the soldiers had realized 
that they were in a desperate, desperate predicament. The Roman seal had been broken. The stone had been rolled away. And most of all, the body was not in the tomb. For a Roman soldier to fail in his duties was an offense punishable by death. But the soldiers were shrewd operators. They did not report to Pilate or to their superior officers. They reported to the Jewish chief priests. They knew that these men, the Jewish chief priests, were as anxious to cover up the miracle as they themselves were. Between the chief priests, the elders, and the soldiers, they put together a story that would explain the empty tomb. This is what they decided, this is the lie they decided to tell. The body was stolen. He's not here. Come and see. That's the words of the angels to the women to calm their fear. Now keep in mind that these women, as well as the disciples, did not expect Jesus to be alive. What did they see in the tomb? They saw the grave clothes lying on the stone shelf, still wrapped in the shape of a body. Jesus had passed through the grave clothes and left them behind as evidence that he was alive. They lay there like an empty co cocoon. There was no sign of a struggle, and the grave clothes were not in a mess. Even the napkin which had been wrapped around his face was folded and carefully in place by itself. Allow me to offer a little definition to this napkin that will help us as we discover the truth in this resurrection story. Say you've been eating at a high-class restaurant. Now, I'm not talking about a restaurant that would give you paper napkins to wipe your mouth, but one that uses cloth napkins. Now say that you've been eating a sumptuous meal and you haven't finished your meal yet, but you have a need to visit the men's room or the women's room. Correct restaurant etiquette teaches us that you would lay your napkin in your chair, indicating to the waiter or waitress that you will return. Get ready for this now. Now say you have finished your meal and you're leaving. Ah, don't leave before you pay your bill and leave a tip. Okay, but now you've done all of that and you're leaving. This time, instead of placing the napkin in the chair, you fold the napkin up neatly and place it to the left of your plate. This has a significant meaning. This means you won't be back. In the chair means you'll be back. But when you fold it up neatly, like that napkin that was placed over Jesus round his face, it was folded up and, and neatly. Now you're finished and you won't be back. That napkin in the tomb that was folded up neatly indicated that Jesus was finished and he would not be back. Jesus was finished with the borrowed tomb, finished with the grave clothes, finished with the napkin that was wrapped around his face. Jesus was finished with them and he would not be back. My late pastor, Reverend Aria Leak Sr. put it this way. The grave is now a thoroughfare. It's not a dead end. We won't need the grave very long. 
because Jesus is going to raise us up from the grave. Well, that's what I have for you this morning, the before and the after of the resurrection. And remember, there's nothing recorded about the actual resurrection inside of the tomb. But there's enough that happened before and after to help us be assured that the resurrection did take place and that Jesus is alive today. How do you know he's alive, Henry? Well, I know he's alive because he lives in my heart. That's why I, every now and then I go to the garden early in the morning while the dew is still on the roses. Because at that time, just me and Jesus are there. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. And the joy that we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. They took him down from the cross and they buried him. And on the third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you visited us in your word. Now we pray that you would keep us reminded that in this darkness, even though it's not over, we do have peace and hope and joy that will carry us through these dark days ahead. We have the assurance that Jesus is not dead. He's not still in the grave, in the tomb, but he rose like he said he would. And, and, and if we would just learn to call him up, he may not come when, he, when we want him, but Father, thank you that he's always on time. Thank you that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Keep us comforted in your word so that we can, no matter what the situation is, Father, so that we can tell a dying world that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it's not about Easter eggs or something that we do, but it's all about grace, which is unmerited, unearned, it's about what Jesus did. Thank you, Lord. And that's all I've got for today. I'll see you next week. Take care. Love you guys. Peace.